context of challenging relationships. Um, and sometimes we just think about the people that are in the relationship, we forget about the kids that are born within some challenging relationships, right? And so when you see certain behaviors or, 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 or certain challenging behaviors, you know, the school that I work at in DC, it's one thing when you might see a child who has an issue, one child that has an issue, but when you see a whole community of children that have certain types of issues, and those issues, when you see a whole community, sorry, of children that have certain types of issues, one thing that you can look at and see is that if you go back and look at the family structures or the relationships within those communities, there are a lot of broken relationships in those communities that these children are coming from. And so there are a lot of challenges that come out, and that's just one aspect. We have not even talked about the financial challenges that come because of broken down relationships, right? And so relationships are not just something, it's not just important for us to have good relationships and understand relationships. And it's not just, we're not just having this whole relationship series this month simply because we just want to be get this romantic feeling and this nice thing to just show off to other people, right? Because sometimes you get this feeling that what you see on Instagram, what you see on Facebook, you think that that's relationships. That might be one aspect of relationships, but relationships are some hard work. Yeah. Relationships are some hard work, right? And so, and so, in, in essence, good relationships come with a grind, right? Just like anything else. And so, good relationships are important because. It doesn't have just an effect on you. It has an effect on the finances of a people. It has an effect on the, gen the, the, the future generations of a people. It has an effect on the community, right? And so I wanna talk a little bit about my testimony a bit because I'm hoping that, and oh, and hello to our friends who, whoever joined us, if anybody joined us on Periscope, you know, following in. Um, you know, but I just wanna share my testimony with the church in hopes that it'll give us some context for some of the things that we're going to talk about today because I think it's relevant. So Father God, as we get ready to get into your word a bit, as we just talk a little bit about relationships, Father God, I'm asking that you would give me the wisdom. You know, I, I don't have all the answers as I like to say, Father God. As a matter of fact, I don't necessarily have anything to offer your people, but you have everything to offer us, Father God. And so while we're just having this discussion here this morning, give us some nuggets, give us some something that's going to challenge us in a good way, something that's going to reshape our minds, that, that, that'll get us in line with what you need us to be in line with so that we can have these good relationships that you would have for us to have, Father God, I pray, amen. And so, you know, just, just to give you all a backdrop as to why relationships are important for me, I grew up as just an average child, right? And the, the, we're talk, what's the title of my sermon today? No Ordinary Love, right? Some of y'all know the artist Sade, she said it best. No Ordinary Love. And what we want to do, we don't want to just have ordinary relationships. Because ordinary relationships today mean, in essence, divorce, right? More than 50% of households of, of, of married relationships today end up in divorce. And when I was studying for my, um, when I was doing the capstone project for my master's, I read one study that showed that in the church, the divorce rate is higher than in the world, right? Which is interesting because in the church, we, we don't believe in divorce. And yet our divorce rate, in some, some studies show, our divorce rates tend to be even higher than those who divorce is not, like they do believe that you can get a divorce. And so we haven't, there, there, there's clearly something that's gone wrong as far as our understanding of relationships. And so we don't want to have an ordinary relationship, right? We, but we want to get to the point where we're above average. We want to have strong, amazing. One of the, one of the things that I, I, I hate to see is going to a church and seeing relationships that it looks like there's no, there's no passion there. It doesn't look like there's any excitement in the relationship. It doesn't look like they, they, they enjoy being in the relationship. And so what we want to do is that we, we want to reshape the mindset of people and relationships. We want to let people know that relationships are a good thing. Relationships are something that you can be excited about, right? But we have to get that back because society has kind of done damage to what relationships, and the church has even sometimes done damage to what relationships look like. So 
from my perspective, being a young man, growing up not believing in divorce, having dreams of one day becoming married and being married for life, and then all of a sudden finding myself going through a divorce, right? That was a challenging, that to this day, going through a divorce is the most challenging thing that I have ever been through. When you are sitting at home, or, or when you're sitting at work also, and you're going through this frustrating moment, frustrating moments where sometimes you find yourself punching walls, punching, punching doors, sometimes punching the couch because you need to find something soft to punch just to be careful because your hand was hurting after a while, like, I can't go punching walls anymore, <laughs> all right? So, 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 so what I understand firsthand is that a, a, a relationship gone bad can cause you to get out of character, right? And a relationship going back, I want to give you all real numbers. So, so through my marriage, I ended up having twins. Some of you guys know about this already. So I have twins, right? I do not get to live with my twins. I don't live with my children. Why? Because of a broken relationship, all right? My, let's take it even deeper. My children spend more time with their stepfather than they get to spend with me, right? Because of broken relationships. Um, um, I was telling Elder, Elder Brown about this earlier today. When you talk about broken relationships, something that happens in, in many broken relationships is that, especially if you're a man, you might have to pay child support. Altogether, the expenses that I have to pay at just through the legal court system, this is not when I even spend time with my children on the one-on-one. -on -one. I pay out, I want to give you all real numbers because I want people, whoever's listening in, uh, just in case, because I know I might even have some friends that are listening in. I pay out close to $25,000 a year just in terms of what the courts have me paying out, all right? So, so, so when I say that relationships have an effect on your finances, I know this firsthand, <laughs> right? I know this firsthand. Now watch this. Coming from, from broken relationships, if, if, you, if we call it baggage, so to speak, right? And you want to now go into another relationship eventually, you got a lot to consider, right? You have a lot to consider. If you have children already, then that might affect who's willing to, uh, to, to date you, so to speak, right? If you have a lot of money that's coming out of your bank account every month, right, and every year, that might change the amount of people that are interested in dating you and eventually being in a long-term relationship with you, correct? Yeah. So these are sometimes, the, these are the consequences that happen in real life in real, in, 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 when we have bad relationships and we haven't learned or understood how to put together good relationships. And, and I just don't want to see people have to go through that. Now, I understand why God allowed me to go through it, because me going through it firsthand allows me to see what some families have been going through for generations. And it's one thing when you're just the first one to just go through this, through this, but it's a whole other mentality when your grandfather's been going through it, your father went through it, you go through it, your children go through it, and you have generations upon generations that go through this, it, it, it changes your mindset. It, because for some people who have been going through this, and it, they've been going through this all their life, they come to expect that that's all that's possible. That's all that's possible, you know? But, but so I wanna challenge us to understand that there's more, relationships are still good, marriage is still an excellent institution, right? And there is power in, 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 in healthy marriages. But one thing that will, and there's power also in healthy dating, okay? Because I believe that you can't ha have a healthy marriage, or it's tougher to have a healthy marriage if you can't date healthy, right? So going to the text that we have for today. Now, thank you, um, Sister White, for, for, for bearing and being patient with me, because I know you're always asking me what text am I gonna have. But sometimes I really don't necessarily even know exactly what text I want to come from. But God, God sometimes doesn't give it to me until, um, you know, 
shortly before I, I, I want to preach. And even though I gave the text, Mark chapter 10, verse 7, I want to come from that same, it's the same verse, so to speak, or same concept, but I want to attack it from Genesis chapter 2. This, I want to attack it from Genesis chapter 2. And if we go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse, let me get to it. I believe I'm going to start at verse 16. No, I'm going to start before that. Um, I'm going to start at verse 7. to verse 15, all right? So, so let, let me read this real quickly, really quickly to you. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Skip on down to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help me for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then this is the same verse that's quoted in, uh, in uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 7. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And then this is, a, this is an interesting verse here too, verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And were not ashamed. So there's some things that I just want to point out, some practical things that I want to point out. Um, and I hope that it's a blessing to you, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching um, through the live stream. So if we go back to verse 7, it says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Watch this. For the, the first thing that I want you all to get and to take note of is the fact that the Lord God formed man. And when we're talking about the, the, within the context of relationships, God, we understand, is getting ready to not just form man, but he's also going to shortly after form woman. Notice that he didn't form boy. He didn't form boy, right? Because if he had formed boy, boy would have to go develop into man before God could make him ready for that relationship. So God forms man, and it's when he forms man, man is the one that's ready in, to become or to step or to enter into relationship. And one of the problems that we have today as far as relationships go is that we have a lot of grown people get into relationships, grown men or, or, or grown males get into relationships, but they're not necessarily men yet. And we have a, a lot of grown females getting into relationships, but they have not necessarily become women as yet. And I, and, and I was paying attention to this fact that it says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. I was like, okay, God, what are you saying? Form, formed man. So, 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 so man is formed, meaning that, that this was not, remember, we talked about this. God has not, whereas the rest of creation, God kind of just called and spoke them into being. It says that God formed man which means that he's shaping man, which means that he's molding man, right? And what I understood is that in order to become a man, in order to become a woman, there's a molding process and a forming process 
that you have to go through. And so we should be careful getting into relationships before we've gone through any real molding process. Amen. Any real situations that have molded us, shaped us, sculpted us, helped us to understand who it is that God would have us to be, right? Because God already had in mind what man would look like. As a, thank you God, because I didn't even put this in the sermon, but you brought this to my, to my. As a matter of fact, it says that God made man and made him in whose image? And God made woman, and even woman is made in the image of God. So when we talk about forming man, man is not really man until he has embraced the image of God in him. And we understand the image of God is strongly, is not necessarily how you're shaped. But the image of God, so to speak, has to do strongly and is strongly connected to the character of God. And so one of the challenges that we have is that we have men and women who are entering into relationships not understanding that you are not really ready for a relationship until the character of God is in you. And so, and so, and so, and, and, and watch this. It says that he formed man out of the dust of the ground, right? So he didn't just form man. So, and, and, and in today's society, we look at dust or dirt as, you, I mean, I'm willing to bet that dirt was still dirty even though it was in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Dirt, dirt still would cling to your hands. Dirt, dirt would still make things messy. And so, one of the things that I think is important when we look, when men and women enter into relationships, is understanding, has this person been through any trying circumstances, some circumstances that might have been a bit messy, a bit difficult as yet, so that I know whether or not, I know how this person handles some challenging times. And sometimes we, we get with somebody because we're like, oh, we're lovey-dovey, everything is perfect, you know, um, um, it's all hearts, uh, it's all sunshine outside, but we have not really understood whether or not this person knows how to go through some challenging times and handle it well as yet. And so all of a sudden you get with them and a challenge comes up, maybe your finances go down for a season and this person is just off the wall, you're like, who did I get with? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because we understand it. What, it, it. Really, what I've come to understand as I've looked at relationships is that I really know whether or not your relationship is a good relationship, and I know whether or not my relationship is a good relationship based on can we make it through difficult times together? Because anybody can go through the easy stuff together. Do you know how to handle a challenge? Do you know how to handle difficulty? Do you know how to handle adversity? Right? So we're talking about, about God forming man. So, so a man, a man is a, we know that a man, when he's really a man, is, it, 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 he's going through some stuff. He knows how to handle the challenges. Second thing I picked up from that verse, verse 7 is that, it says that, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So even that can be tied into what we're talking about, the character of God. So the breath of life, the spirit of God is in this man. Right? Then the other thing is that it says that not, it's not until the man is formed by the dust of the ground, right? And not until he, uh, the, 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 the breath of life is breathed into him that man becomes a living soul. And so what we have to be careful of is getting with people, especially, especially as Christians. But, and, and I don't want to just say getting with people, but we have to be careful ourselves of getting into relationships with a person let me rephrase that. The breath of life, right? If I'm spiritually dead, or if the other person is spiritually dead, we need to be careful of getting into a relationship with one another. Right? If the breath of life is not in us. Because the challenge that might arise is that we might not be able to do things God's way. We might not understand the vision that God has for our life. We might not follow his directions as far as what relationships should be like. 
So then we move on down, and then verse 8, I had skipped over this before, but I can read it. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And the Lord God took the man, oh yeah, I, I love this. And the Lord, I skipped over to verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. I'm going to say it once, once again. I'm going from verse 8, and I'm skipping on down to verse 15. It says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed. And the Lord God, this is verse 15 now, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. I love that because what I realize is that part of God developing this man is that the Lord God gives this man, and he, I believe he gives men and women to this day, a place to live. Right? And that sounds real, that sounds real like, like, what does this have to do with relationships? Well, remember, one of the verses that we read as the memory, as, as the verse for today is, um, therefore shall a man leave, right, his mother and father, and do what? Leave his wife. One of the challenges that many relationships have is that people get into relationships, people get married, but they don't have a place to live to call their own. So let me be real with you. One of the challenges of my relationship was that when we got married, we got married and moved into my parents' house. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. It sounds like a good idea. We can save money or what have you. I would challenge you to say it would be better for you to struggle by yourselves for a little bit, making it, but being kings and queens of your own castle than to get married wanting to be kings and queens in your own relationship, but then having to move into another king and queen's castle, right? And the challenge is that when you get married, when you're at the point where you're ready to be married and be a man and to be a woman, you're ready to make the decisions. You know, watch this, to use the word that we talk about in creation life. You are ready to have dominion over your own house. You can't have dominion over your own house when you move into your parents' house. Can't do, right? No, right? Right? How many of the parents in here, if your children move in with their spouse, you're going to let them have dominion over your house? No. no. Right? And so, but watch this. What happens is that when, if you do move into a parent's house, you start to feel cramped. And sometimes the one whose parents it is, they feel fine because they're used to this, right? I, I live with mom and dad all the time. That's fine. But for the other person who is expecting to be able to live free, to make as much noise as they would like to, to dress how they would like to around the house, but they have to move into now somebody else's parents' house. They might still have brothers and sisters living there. It's a cramped lifestyle. So my challenge, and like I said, some of this stuff is just real practical, is God, and, and I believe God showed his life, God said, listen, as a man, I have given you now a home to live in, right? I'm not just putting you into a relationship and you don't have anywhere to live. No, you have a place to live. You have a place that you've been given dominion over, all right? So be careful to get into a relationship if you have not prepared a place to live that you can call your own. Then there's another thing if you watch this. It doesn't just say that he put him in the Garden of Eden, right? But it says that he put him in the Garden of Eden to do what? To dress it and to keep it. Meaning that, and at first I had used the word, the words that he had given God, that he had given man a job. But I'll rephrase it and say that man, when a man is a man or when a woman is a woman, they have at least to a certain extent discovered their purpose in life. Right? And some of the challenges that some relationships go through is that you haven't or you feel like you have not discovered your purpose in life as yet, or the person that you, you're trying to be with has not discovered what their vocation or their purpose will be in life, and then you get with them, and then all of a sudden, they eventually find out what their vocation in life, what they want it to be, and then all of a sudden they switch the game up on you, <laughs> right? And it causes some new challenges. So, so I think that what God will have us to be, and it's not to say that you will always know exactly how it will manifest itself, but I understand now, being 31 years old, 
the importance, how much better my relationship would have been if I had had some sense of purpose as far as what direction at least God would have me to go in, right? And, and as a matter of fact, God had tried to give me, right? My story goes that he had tried to give me some direction, but I had avoided, avoided it or had run away from it. And who knows if that's some of the reasons why I had some of the challenges that I had in my relationship, right? So, so, so understand that you want to seek God for some sense of what, what God, what, what have you put me on this earth to accomplish? In essence, what you're doing is, and I always talk about this, I feel like in order to be successful almost in anything in life, it calls, it calls for some sense of self-assessment. God, what are my strengths? Because you need this. What, what are the strengths that I will bring to this relationship? What are some of the weaknesses that I have to be mindful that I might bring to this relationship, right? Self-assessment. So what, 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 what is the purpose that God has designed me to accomplish? Watch this. Watch this. A man, would, a man will ask it, and a woman will ask herself this question too. Am I yet a husband? And am I yet a wife? Because some people think that you become husband and you become wife when you get married. Not understanding that you need to understand or have the characteristics and, 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 and have the principles of being a husband and having the and have the principles of being a wife before you get into that relationship. You know, some things you will learn on the job. You don't want to learn everything on the job, though. Right? You don't want to learn everything on the job. You, you're, 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 that's one of the reasons why I believe we have such a high divorce rate. We're over fifty percent of marriages, both outside the church and inside the church, um, I mean, are, are ending up in divorce because a lot of people are settling for learning on the job. And there's so much information out there to help you to at least learn some basic things before you get yourself into a relationship. So, so once again, uh, once again, that sense of purpose. So, so he puts man in there to dress it and to keep it. All right. So. And this is, a, this, this is a call for men. I had to learn this also. Notice that even God said, I want you, Adam, to continue to maintaining the Garden of Eden to help it to continue to look nice. Right? And I know for a lot of us men, I know myself, I don't necessarily always need things to look nice in order to work with it. You know, my food does not necessarily have to look nice in order for me to eat it. But, um, you know, there's some days where I'm like, yo, you know what, I can get away with just wearing a hoodie and some sneakers and some sweats. But I believe that God values us making things look nice. You know? Making sure that the house looks nice, the lawn is cut, you're dressed, your, your, your hair is where it needs to be. You know, you wear a suit for your wife once in a while or what have you. I just understand now the value in presentation. Presentation is key, right? Presentation is very important. Because especially when you got the girl because you were looking nice, you know, don't switch it up on her now. Don't, don't switch the game up on her. And young ladies also, uh, older ladies also, um, you got your man because you were looking presentable, right? You are, what, what's the word that it says? You, um, you dressed it and you kept it, right? Continue to dress it and continue keeping it. Just some simple stuff, practical stuff this morning. But watch this. Watch this. There are other tasks. I love it. There are tasks that he specifically gave to Adam, but there's some joint tasks that he gives to both Adam and Eve as a couple, right? So he tells them to be fruitful. At some point, he tells them to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, right? The reason why I love this is because I believe that certain relationships, many relationships fail because People enter into a relationship just expecting that this lovey-dovey feeling will carry them out throughout the rest of their lives. And I believe that in order to have a strong relationship, you should set goals for the relationship. What are some things that we want to accomplish? We know God told us, okay, there's certain things that we should accomplish individually, but what are some things that we would like to accomplish together, right? Is, it, is there a ministry that we'd like to accomplish together? Um, you know, is there a business or financial goal that we'd like to set 
for ourselves? Is there a goal that we would like to set as far as our influence in the community or our, our influence on other couples, our influence on other people um, out there? What are the goals that we will set for our life? Do we want to uh, travel uh, a certain amount of times per year? What goals have you set for your relationship? Because we, if you understand anything about success principles, it is very hard to be successful when you're just shooting in the dark, right? Almost, like I said before, almost anything, is, or there are certain keys to success in anything. One of those keys is having uh, 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 an end goal in mind as far as what you would like to happen so that you can have a target to shoot at. Imagine if, if you were to go somewhere and let's imagine that somebody was having target practice and they walked in, but there was no target set up and they just had to just start aiming at whatever. No, you target practice, you, it helps you to build, why? Because there's a part, they, they had the target set somewhere so that you can know exactly what you're aiming at. Same thing goes for relationships, right? So if we go to verse 16, it says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest eat freely. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What I want us to get from this text and understand is that God has helped man to understand how to have standards and boundaries. How to have standards and boundaries. All right? You want to be where... The Bible says, I forgot exactly where the text is, but, but you know, a man with basically no standards and no boundaries is like a city that is without walls, right? And back in the day, if you understand anything about a city that's without walls, a city with, that's without walls meant that walls were important to all the kingdoms in ancient times because the wall would protect the people. So a man who does not have standards and a man who has not set up boundaries for himself, or a woman also who has not set up standards and boundaries, that means that they can be easily infiltrated. They can be easily overcome by the enemy, whatever you want to call the enemy. So you need to, uh, 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 you need to understand what boundaries do I need to set in place for my life? First things first, what boundaries do I need to set in place as far as this relationship? What will and will not happen at certain part, point in this relationship, right? Sexual healing, what, 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 what? And you got to respect a person who's able to say, listen, we will not engage in certain acts before we get married, right? And sometimes it shows more respect for a person. You, you show that you respect a person all the more by saying, listen, we will not have sex before I put a ring on it and we walk down the aisle together, mm -hmm. right? It might seem boring in this day and age, right? Mm -hmm. But that's what real respect and boundaries do, right? That's when if, if anything worthwhile usually is done with patience, long suffering, and done with order, right? We talked about that the last time I, I preached, right? God said that I could have created everything in one day, but yet I chose to create everything in stages, and each stage was good, and then eventually when we got to the culmination of everything, it was very good. The problem is, that we want the very good stuff on the first day. Right. You know, and God's like, listen, all this stuff is good, but this thing that's very good over here can sometimes be very detrimental if you have it too early. If you have it too early, have mercy. Right? So then going on to going on to verse 18, and the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Yeah, this is, this is interesting what God was showing me here. Out of, the, out, of the, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field but for Adam, there was not found and help me for him. One, one thing I want us to pay attention to is that God eventually, right, right, God can trust a man to have 
free will, right? And that, that's a question to ask yourself, and a question for, my, for me to ask myself, right? We just talked about boundaries. Can God trust you with free will? It's a beautiful thing that he allowed Adam to do right here, because what he says to Adam is, listen, because we already know that he's given him dominion. He says, Adam, I will allow you, I will, even though I am the creator, I will allow you to give a name to these things. Meaning, and whatever you name it, that's what it will be. Whatever you name it, that's what it will be. be. Why? Because the relationship that we have right now, I can trust you to name these things what they need to be named. And the problem that we have sometimes is that, especially when it pertains to relationships, is that God may not have brought you who he would like to bring you as yet, because maybe he cannot trust you with that good thing as yet. Maybe he can't. Maybe he can't. So now watch this. Watch this. What are, what, so, 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 so now watch this. Not only does he allow him and give him the free will to name it, but now the question becomes, becomes what is he naming them, right? And I want you to understand that God has given us the ability to name things. And remember, sometimes, or, or, or watch this, sometimes the challenge that we have as far as relationships and even other things is that we have not named exactly what it is that we would like. Or when God gives us that thing that we would like, we fail to put a name on it at the proper time. And so sometimes what happens is that we like to kind of just go around Right, right. So, so sometimes we have certain people that like to operate and like, well, we're just friends, but they don't want to just they don't want to put a name on it. Right. Well, 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 we're we go and see each other. We're talking, but we never get to the point where we actually put a name on it. And here's why putting a name on it, um, putting a name on it is crucial. When you put a name on something. It forces you to be committed to it. And Pastor talked about this the other week, as a matter of fact, also. The reason sometimes why we're afraid to put names on certain things is because now, once we put a name on it, once, once I've said boyfriend or girlfriend, or once I've said husband or wife, th that comes with another level of commitment. And I love it. One of, my, one, one, of my, one of my mentors said this. There's a difference between, the, the reason why I encourage, some people are like, well, you know, there's no need for us to get married or what have you. You know, we just have a great relationship or what have you. Okay, cool, understood, right? But what I understand from marriage is that there's a difference between somebody just being in the contract and somebody being in the covenant, yeah. right? Because contract, contract says that you know, if you don't fulfill what you were supposed to fulfill, I no longer have to fulfill what I was going to fulfill. But what covenant says is, even though you choose not to fulfill what you're supposed to fulfill, I will continue going on and fulfilling what I'm supposed to fulfill. Right? And so, and so, and so, what happens is that a lot of people just get stuck in this contract phase. Contract phase. Instead of putting the, putting the, they don't want to give it the marriage title because the marriage title comes with an added a level of responsibility. Added level of responsibility, you know? But, 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 but this is the thing. Usually, when you take on more responsibility, you get rewarded more for taking on that responsibility also. Right? That's just the way of the world. So when Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But, but for Adam, they were not found and healthy for him, right? And this is what's beautiful. We just talked about naming things. And Lord God, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the woman. Watch this. God caused a deep sleep to fall on him, right? God, the first thing that God causes to happen is that once the man realizes that he wants 
uh, in essence, a, 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 a romantic relationship, so to speak, or he wants a relationship with this woman. He would like a woman or somebody to marry, or let's, we can even say if there's a woman who wants a man to marry, what God causes to happen is a deep sleep, right? Or a deep rest. And I thought it was beautiful because we've been talking about rest. What God causes, notice that God doesn't say, okay, go out and start working and trying to find this man. But what God says, okay, you want, a, you want a wife? All right, the first thing that you need to do is rest in me. First thing you need to do, your, your, your rest in me needs to get, it's cause, it calls it a deep sleep, right? So Adam is not in a state where he's worrying about finding this person. God has caused him to have rest, so to speak. And in Adam's resting stage, what, does, what happens? God says, okay, boom, I'm going to take this rib. Right? You, you're not even conscious to the fact that I'm working this thing out in your favor right now. You're just in this deep sleep, but I'm taking this rib, and I'm forming now in fashion. While you're just at rest, I'm forming and fashioning this other person for you to be with. Right? So, 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 so my admonishment to you is that the fastest way to find what it is that you're looking for is to simply allow yourself to be at rest in God. That's the fastest way for you to get to the blessing that God has for you, right? And so as he slept, God removed the rib, right? And watch this, sacrifice. So God removed the rib. In order for God, and watch this, Adam is actually perfect, right? But in order for God to give Adam and Eve, it still called call, call for some sacrifice. It still called for Adam to have to lose something. He lost his rib. God went in and took something out of Adam, sacrifice. You lost something in order that Adam could gain something even greater or someone even greater. And sometimes we think that we're going to gain the relationship that we like without a level of sacrifice. Right? There, watch this. If you want to get married, men, there are going to be some relationships with some other women that's going to have to get sacrificed. And, and it doesn't mean that they were even bad relationships. Watch this. Therefore, I'm, I'm, I'm giving parts of my sermon away early. Therefore shall a man do what? Leave his mother oh, and his father, right? And cleave to his wife. Which means that what? Which means that in some sense of, or in some way, shape, or form, he has lost something. That relationship that he was used to having with his mother and father is no longer the same. There's something had to be sacrificed in order for him to get to the relationship that he wanted to have. You might have to sacrifice playing video games. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You might have to do it. You know, you might have to sacrifice your own will all the time. You might have to sacrifice some sleep. You will. <laughs> you will, right? But 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 in the sacrifice, in the sacrifice, something greater is about to happen. Something better is about to have your way. I'm sure that all the married couples in here are much happier and much more willing to sacrifice whatever it is that they had to sacrifice in order to have the blessing of the husband or wife that they have today. Amen. And, then, and, 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 and that's key also. Watch this. It says that, watch this. And the rib which, God, which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. Watch this. Watch what it says and brought her unto the man. Brought her unto the man. It goes back to what I was saying before. The man didn't have to go hunting, even though there's a certain level of pursuit that we understand that has to happen, but, but the man, it's like God just dropped her in his lap. And sometimes we go around worrying like, God, what, what, is, is this ever going to happen? And God's like, listen, if you would just trust me, I will drop this game right in front of you if you're paying attention. You worry about all kinds of stuff. You trying to strategize. You going online, creating a bunch of online accounts, <laughs> and you keep trying to find these people. And he's like, listen, and I'm not, not, not to knock you. He might drop them to you through a, an online account. You know what I'm saying? I'm just talking about the fact that this goes back to the, to the theme of faith that we have for this year. Even when it comes to finding a spouse, it has to be by faith. And if it's by faith, it will be so much better than if we just went out there and tried to create it on our own. 
So then watch this. And we're almost done. We're almost done. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Notice, notice, what, notice what Adam did there. He named her. He named her, right? You have to, we, we have to get to a point where when we see what God has given us, that we just say, listen, that's it. That's the one. Sometimes, I, I know it's happened to me before, where you're just sitting around like, all right, God, like, should I move on it or not? You know, like, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, should I date this person? Maybe not. You know, and you always stuck in this. You know, the, the Bible talks about, like, how long walks he between two opinions, right? And Adam sees and he's like, wow. He's like, okay, I've done my homework. This woman is from God. I will name her woman. How many men do we know? Just because in our society it's the men that let's say that propose to the woman. But how many men do we know should have been long time said, hmm, you know what? God has shown me that this is wife. And put the name wife. Give her the name wife. But instead, sit back like, uh, I, I'm going to just chill. <laughs> I'm just going, uh, not yet. You know, got, man, I'm like, yo, y'all been fiancés for like 10 years. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you're going to be a fiancé for that, like, what else do you need to learn about this person before you say you, they're they going to be wife? Like, you know, you just taking out a whole chunk of her life. Should have been put wife. Yeah, there's going to be certain things. You're not going to know everything before you get into the situation. You've learned everything that you can. You might as well just learn the rest within a marital relationship. Give her the name wife. Give her the name wife. And so watch this, watch this. So he names her woman because she was taken out of man. And I think that's important too because she was taken out of man, meaning that they're, they are taken out of man, meaning that they are very similar, right? I think sometimes, too many times, we get with people who are not on the same track as we are, okay? And when I say similar, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be similar in personalities or what have you, but at least similar in our values, similar in our worldview. Once again, similar in, 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 in our goal and, and how we plan to um, run the household or what have you, you see what I'm saying? Because sometimes you get with somebody who don't share the same values and you just, well, <laughs> That's another sermon. Um, but watch this. Verse 24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's one of the reasons why I believe it is important that we get with somebody who is similar to us. Because it makes it easier for us to be that one flesh. That one that that oneness with each other, right? Because you have enough challenges when you're already similar. You know what I'm saying? Why even add on to that? And this is the thing. One, I, and I want to admonish us that they shall become one flesh. It doesn't say that they shall become one person and one person making their own decisions as they think best, etc., etc. They become one. Meaning that I no, no longer do I have my own identity. My identity is wrapped up in this person that I am now married to. So then, when it comes to making household decisions, it's not just me making my decision on my own. It's about, okay, what, what is going to be our strategy, honey? Well, we disagree, well, we're going to sit here and discuss it until we figure out what we are going to do. What decision, now, it might not be the decision that I necessarily want, but I will at least be intentional about setting up and saying, whatever decision or whatever move we make, it will be because we came together and decided together that this is the move that we will make. Sometimes you're going to get your way. Other times I'm going to get my way. Sometimes I might not even think your way is necessarily the best way, but we are one now. We make these decisions together. Amen. One flesh. Leave and cleave. And we already talked about leave and cleave. Um, and 
how that entails. He was like, oh, watch this, watch this. Verse 25 says this, and I thought that it was interesting. It said, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. To be naked means to be fully exposed, right? And I just want to admonish those who are still not in a, in a marriage, but looking eventually to be in marriage. Make sure that whoever it is, it is that you, whoever it is that you choose to marry, is somebody who, when you expose who you are to them, they love you for who you are. Not love you for who they might try to turn you into, or would like to turn you into, or what have you. But 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 it says that they they were naked in front of each other. They were fully exposed in front of each other, and they were not ashamed. Meaning that one wasn't judging the other for who they were. The other one wasn't uh, name calling. One one wasn't degrading the other. But they both felt freely to be who God made them to be. Right? Doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you get into a relationship where you can't challenge each other to con continually be growing and progressing together. But if somebody is, is is not appreciating the person who God made you to be, then there's a problem. It says here that Adam and Eve were naked; they were fully exposed, but were not ashamed. Were not ashamed, right? And then watch this. I, I, I want to close. I want to close with this. I want to close with this. Remember when we talked about, when I did the, the sermon about creation, and I talked about the fact that God created all things before Adam and Eve were even in existence, but he was creating it for them. So he set everything that they would ever need for their sustenance, for their, for their provision in place before he even put them onto the scene. If we take that same principle and watch, imagine this. Eve was created after Adam, which would mean, so to speak, if we go with that same analogy, that on Eve's behalf, everything was created that she would need for her provision before she was even created. One of those things, when it comes to Eve, would be man, meaning that in my opinion, man, husband, is put in place to set the tone of service to Eve, that Eve would always be have her provision and be provided for through the man that God had prepared for her, right? And so, and so it's just a call specifically to the men that, that, that let's take up the challenge that we will set the tone in our relationships, whether we're in a relationship now, whether we will be in a relationship in the future, to set that tone of service. Because one of the things that happens is that many men are really ready to rush and say, well, a woman is supposed to submit to men. <laughs> right? <laughs> woman is supposed to submit to man. And listen, I believe that's a beautiful, submission is not, I believe submission is a beautiful thing. But what society has gotten wrong is thinking that a woman just automatically submits to any old kind of man. Right. And what I dare challenge us to understand is that even though God or, or the Bible says a woman should submit to a man, God has set a precedent that, yeah, a woman might submit to a man, but man, I have actually designed you to set the tone of service and submission to your woman first. Amen. And when you set that tone, she will have no problem submitting to you. But you gotta set the tone. That's right. And the last thing that I'll say, or maybe the last two things that I'll say, is that God is not, God set the tone really for us. Because all over the Bible it says things like, even while we were yet sinners, that he died for us, right? He served us, right? It says that, it says that, here in his love, not that we love God, but that what? He loved us first, right? So God himself sets this tone or, 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 or this, 
is he puts in order that, listen, I have set the tone of submission and service for you. Now, man, I have designed you to set the tone of submission and service for your, for your wife. And watch this, when you do that, your wife will begin to set a new tone of service and submission for you, right? And when you have a, a re relationship that are built on serving one another, I, you know one of the things that I had thought about the, a couple of years ago, I said, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing when, you, there's two ways that you can get what you want. You can purchase what you want for yourself, which is one, you, you might get it, but it's another thing when you say, you know what, instead of me purchasing things for myself, I will purchase things for my husband or for my wife, right, and give them everything they want. And because I give them everything they want, they purchase and give me everything that I want. So instead of me now giving myself this gift or, or, or this thing that I wanted, it's given to me as a gift from the other, right? Which gives it even more meaning, makes it even more powerful, right? And so that, that, that's really the word for today. Let me just check and see if there's one. Mm, mm, mm. I'll leave you all with this, this last thought, this last final thought. I think a couple of years ago, God, he gave me this, this idea for a recontextualization of love, right? And love, one of, the, one of the things about marriage, relationships, we're talking about sexual healing, we're talking about no ordinary love. I think that the, most, the, the, the greatest example that we see of no ordinary love is God deciding that he would recontextualize what love looked like for us. Many, some of you might have read the book, the, the Five Love Languages. And I think it's a powerful book because in the book he talks about the fact that Sometimes we show people love in the way that we would that we want to show them love. And part of serving and submitting is saying, no, I will show you in the way, love in the way that you understand and like to receive love. Right? And I thought that it was beautiful because Jesus even shows us that same example by saying, listen, if you want to show me love, this is how you do. If you love me, keep my commandments, right? But this is what? This is a beautiful thing. Even Jesus himself says, all right, I will set the tone by showing you love in a way that you can understand. So watch this. He, God starts off in heaven, you know, and he's trying to speak to us through, 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 from heaven. And he's like, man, these, these, these children, they're just not getting it. They're just not getting it. So what I'll do is I will begin to speak through men like Moses, and I'll begin to speak through other prophets or what have you, to try to convey this message of love that I'm trying to give to them. But he's conveying it to them, and they're still not getting it. Still not getting it. So then all of a sudden, what happens is, he says, okay, I will send a man like John onto the scene. But they're still not getting it. To the point where he says, all right, this is what I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to come down as a man myself, so that they can understand the language that I'm speaking, so that they can see it firsthand. And then it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? right? So that we have this beautiful imagery that of God saying, listen, I will continue to recontextualize my love to make it understandable for you in order to serve you best. And then he says, listen, I'm gonna go so far, no longer will my love and my, no longer will I even just dwell among you, but it's better that I go away, right? So that when I go, I will send the Holy Spirit. So not only will I dwell among you now, but now I will even dwell in you. A constant recontextualization of love that constantly goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Starting from the abstract, out in the heavens, to then coming on, speaking through other people, third parties, right? Then to saying, no, I will come myself and be around you, but then saying, no, you know, we'll take it one step further. I will begin to live in you. And so I'm praying that as we go throughout the rest of this month, as we get ready, many of us will, will do some nice things with each other um, tomorrow or, 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 or for our families or for our loved ones tomorrow. Let's understand that God has, continue, has, has, has set this example of a, con of a love and a relationship that constantly goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in submission in service, in understanding, in communication, right? And so, Father God, we're just so thankful that 
that while we were yet sinners, you continue to show us your love and your service by dying for us, Lord. We're so thankful that we who don't deserve your love have gotten your love on many different levels, Father God. You said that you could have stayed out where you were. You could have wiped us out. But you said not only will you not wipe us out, but that you will continue to show us a deeper and deeper love. You said that you would show us a sacrificial love, a love that was willing to give up something, a love that was willing to give up heaven for, for a time, a love that was even willing to give up life in order that we might have life, Lord. And that we might have life more abundantly, Lord. And I'm asking that you would continue all, for those of us who are in here and those of us who might be listening on Periscope, that you would, you would give those who are spouses deeper levels of service for their spouse, that their spouse might continually know deeper love, a love that comes from you, Lord. I'm asking that you would be with those, those who are not yet married, that you would continue to shape them and mold them into people who, when they do find that right spouse, Lord, when you, to use your words, Father God, when you present them with the right spouse, Lord, they will learn how to go deeper and deeper into the love that you have designed that a man and woman should have for each other. And we pray, Father God, that at the heart of that love will be their love for you, Lord. Their love for you. We, have, we pray for those spouses, Lord, who may not necessarily know who you are fully as yet. We pray that through the love of their spouses that we, they would come to know who you are, Lord. The name of this title, Father God, is This Is No Ordinary Love. Sade made that song years and years ago, Lord. And we want that when people look at the relationships that come out of Penuel SDA Church, when they look at the relationships that, that come out of the, 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 the folks that might be watching on Periscope, Father God, we want them to be able to say that, wow, this is no ordinary love. We want them to say that there must be something more to the love that comes out of this human being. We want them to be able to say that this is a love that only a God who is all loving could give. And I want some of that love and to come and get to know you, Lord. So let our marriages, Father God, let our marriages, even for those who are dating, Lord, let, let their dating relationships be witnesses and testaments, Father God, I pray, to the power of God and the power of the love that God has for us, Father God. Let other people looking on the out, from the outside looking in be, be, be able to really say, like, like we are attracted to this type of love, the love that God has for us because of the way that we've seen it manifested in these relationships, Lord. Don't let our relationships just be a selfish thing that's just for us. Let our relationships be examples that bring other people into the kingdom, Lord. Starting with us first and then all those who are looking at us as examples, Father God. Help that our relationships would remind the amazing love that God, just remind us and remind others of the amazing love that God has for his church. Because that's all marriage is, Father God. It's a, a symbol of the relationship that you have to your bride, your church. And so we thank you for the word this morning, Father. We thank you for, for, for the possibility of love, Lord. We thank you that we are alive to experience your love, Father God. We thank you that even when we had not deserved it, you still continue to show your love unto us, Lord. Yeah. Now we pray that deeper and deeper levels of love might, 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 might manifest themselves in us. And we ask, Father God, that love, your love, would be the foundation of all that we do. All that we do, Lord. And when we get to heaven, we pray that we will see thousands, yea, even millions of people who enter into the kingdom saying, we, we, we didn't, maybe we didn't know who you were. But when we saw the relationship that, that, that sister whites, the sisters whites had with their husband, that Elder Brown has with his wife, that the young people will eventually have with their future husbands and wives, Lord, that something about that drew me and allowed me to come to know who Christ was. And because of that, I was saved. We thank you, Lord.
that you trust us enough to give us such a great responsibility, Lord, and help us to make you proud in our relationship decisions. We pray. Amen. Amen.